This video was brought to you by our Patreon backers like Nathan M. Support the channel, get exclusive live streams, early access to videos, behind the scenes posts, the ability to choose our video topics and more. The link to that's down below. So what's happened? Well, essentially, over the last 30 years or so, Russia and China have been forming a sort of anti-American alliance, and relations have been rapidly improving in recent years. The reason we're doing this video now is because last Tuesday, an armada of 10 Chinese and Russian warships sailed through the Sugaru Strait, which separates the Sea of Japan from the Pacific. This was after Russia and China had finished performing their annual joint military exercises in the Sea of Japan, which have happened every year since 2012. This was the first time, however, that Russian and Chinese ships have left their exercises via the Sugaru Strait, which is why it caused some consternation in Japan. Normally, military transit through a strait of this size would be against international law, specifically the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which defines a country's territorial waters as those extending 12 nautical miles from that country's coastline. Because the Sugaru is just 12 miles wide at its narrowest point, between Tapi Misaki and Chirakami Misaki, passage through the Sugaru requires ships to pass well within 12 nautical miles of Japan's coastline. In the late 1970s, however, Japan unilaterally decided to limit its territorial waters to just three nautical miles from its coastline in the Tsugaru, allowing foreign vessels to transit through the strait. Apparently, this was to allow US ships carrying nuclear weapons through the strait, which would otherwise be against Japan's prohibition against nuclear weapons in its territory, known as the Atomic Energy Basic Law, which the US forced Japan to sign up to after World War II. Japan hoped the prospect of US nuclear warships would act as a deterrent against China, and discourage them from attacking Japan in the future. But while Japan might be comfortable with an ally like the US sailing through those waters, they were less keen on the Chinese and Russian passage, which was widely perceived as antagonistic. Both Russia and China have territorial disputes with Japan over the Kuril and Senkaku Islands respectively, which is why this passage caused some anxiety in Japan. The Japanese Defence Ministry announced that they'd analysed the purpose of the passage, and in response, the Chinese Defence Ministry insisted that their activities were in line with international law, and accused Japan of holding ulterior motives with its accusations and hyping up of the situation. You get the point. For the first time ever, China and Russia teamed up to antagonise Japan, who they both have ongoing disputes with. So, how did we get here, with Russia and China being best mates? This was a symptom of a 30-year trend that's accelerated recently, Russia and China's ever-improving military alliance. From basically the 60s until 1991, Russia and China weren't best mates at all. They were the two big communist superpowers, and they both wanted to be number one. They had a brief border war in 1969, but tensions were permanently high until 1991, when they made up and signed the 1991 Sino-Soviet border agreement. From then on, things have only got cosier. In 1992, they declared they were pursuing a constructive partnership. In 1996, they said it had become a strategic partnership. And in 2001, they signed the Treaty of Good Neighbourliness and Friendly Cooperation, which is maybe the most chubbily named treaty in the history of international affairs. The relationship has been accelerated by a good personal relationship between Putin and Xi. Xi has described Putin as his best friend and colleague, and Putin said in May that Sino-Russian relations were at their best level in history. So, how did this happen? Well, the relationship began as predominantly an economic one. Russia basically sold two things to China, oil and military hardware. Russia had a lot of oil, and China, which was growing super fast, needed more and more energy. In 2007, Russia exported about $15 billion worth of goods to China, mostly oil. In 2019, that figure had quadrupled to $57 billion. Russia overtook Saudi Arabia to become China's largest oil supplier, and China overtook Germany to become Russia's largest trading partner. The other thing that Russia sold to China was military equipment. China was developing so fast that its military didn't really have time to keep up, which meant that it had to rely on Russian arms and tech to keep its military up. China still relies on Russian military imports today. About 80% of its arms imports come from Putin, but it's been able to basically copy all of Russia's military tech to the point that, well, they don't really need Russia anymore. 
According to Russia's own defence review from 2014, China is expected to have fully weaned itself off Russian tech by 2025. But for now, things are still going strong. It's worth noting that part of the reason that China and Russia do so much trade together is that they've both suffered Western-backed trade embargoes on and off for the last few years or so. Obviously, if you can't trade with the West, you'll become more reliant on non-Western allies for trade. Anyway, while the relationship began as an economic one, in the last 10 years or so it's developed into a military one. While Russia and China don't have a formal military alliance, they've been running regular joint exercises for the last decade or so, and things have really heated up recently. Since 2018, China and Russia have performed four joint exercises, the latest coming in August this year, when Russian forces joined the Chinese in Ningxia for the most comprehensive joint military exercise either side has performed in recent history. Unsurprisingly, the fact that China and Russia are becoming ever closer military allies has caused some anxiety in the West, and especially America. If the idea of your two most powerful enemies forming a military alliance wasn't stressful enough, the fact that they're both simultaneously getting ready for separate military campaigns is making life in the US even tougher. As we mentioned in our previous video, China seems keener than ever on forcing reunification with Taiwan, which Biden has promised to defend, while Russia is currently engaged in a long-running, low-intensity war with Ukraine, who are also supported by America. It's not 100% clear that the US have the military resources to deal with the Chinese invasion of Taiwan, let alone a Chinese invasion of Taiwan and a surge in Russian activities in Ukraine. So, what should the US and the West do here? Well, Russia and China are good mates at the moment, but it's mostly a marriage of convenience. They still disagree on a fair few things. China refuses to sign up to any nuclear weapons treaty, doesn't recognise Russia's claim to Crimea, and annoyed some Russian politicians when it described itself as a near-Arctic power, implying that they plan on competing with Russia for Arctic resources in the future. They're also not as great trade partners as they used to be. China doesn't need Russia's military hardware anymore, and, as it weans itself off fossil fuels, won't need Russian oil much in the future either. These days, they're mainly mates because they both agree on one thing, their dislike of the West, and especially the US. Western sanctions and the US's willingness to throw its military weight around have forced them closer together than they naturally would be. This new split between the West and the US on one side and China and Russia on the other is clearly dangerous, and it's making war more likely across the world, from Ukraine to Taiwan. These days, you get a lot of flashy pieces in the mainstream media about war, talking about who's got better sonic technology, or who's got more nukes, but really, all you need to know about World War III, or war between any of the current superpowers, is that it would be apocalyptic. And the world should do everything it can to avoid it, and if that potentially involves the West relaxing some of the pressure on Russia and China to avoid creating an anti-Western alliance, then that might be a good idea. But what do you think? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you want to get even more involved, then you can back us on Patreon, which gets you a whole load of perks from exclusive live streams to early access to videos, behind the scenes posts, and the ability to choose our video topics. The link to the Patreon is down below, and thanks for your support because we literally couldn't do it without you. Also, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we post a video. And special thanks to our Patreon backers for making videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name listed at the end of the videos just like these people, then be sure to back us on Patreon.